Okay, so hi everybody. It's uh, very nice that you joined the session today. Uh, we want to talk about IIoT monitoring with MQT Sparkplug, HivenQ, and InfluxDB. So, um, next slide, please. So, we um, are we are uh, Dominic and, and Anya. So, um, can can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, thank you. So we're, we're Dominic and Anja. Um, I am the CTO here at uh, HyphenQ and uh, Anja is a senior consultant also here at HyphenQ. You can also reach out to us um, over Twitter as well as um, yeah, LinkedIn. So here are the, the, the uh, credentials you can, can use to reach out to us. Okay, next slide, please. So before we start um, about IoT and um, and why it's important and how Influx uh, and MQDT, how they actually uh, work together. A quick, a quick thing about HyphenQ. So we're a company, we were founded in 2012. Uh, so we're based here in Germany. Uh, we have customers for, uh, in the industrial IoT space as well as in the automotive space. And uh, what we do is we help move data to and from connected devices in an efficient, fast and reliable manner. And um, next slide, please. And um, yeah, what we do is we build the HiveMQ platform. And the HiveMQ platform is used to connect devices like cars, like machines, um, usually over the internet or on the edge to the HiveMQ platform, uh, which then uh, is used to distribute data to other uh, places like Kafka, InfluxDB, databases, ERP systems, and a lot of other things. And usually what we deal a lot with is high availability, it's about uh, observability, enterprise security, um, and so on. And also especially IT and OT systems integration, which we will talk ab about today, and also how um, time series databases like InfluxDB play into that. So we can go to the next slide, please. Let's talk about the status quo um, first uh, in the IIoT. So the industrial Internet of Things is something for people who don't have a lot of context. Um, there's really a lot of problematic um, things happening here because there's this gap of um, IT and OT, which means of information technology, which um, I believe a lot of people in this audience come from, but also OT, which is the operations technology side. And uh, these two, let's say, um, usually departments in a lot of companies have a lot of things, um, yeah, in uh, which are uh, quite a bit different from a goal perspective. The OT folks usually make sure that things are running all the time, while IT folks um, are a lot more agile usually in most companies uh, than than the OT folks. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So, a huge problem, people who are dealing with industrial Internet of Things today is that there are a lot of data silos. And what this means, the data silos um, are, we have a lot of systems, very isolated. And if you go to a traditional factory, you see systems who are not very well interconnected with proprietary data formats, with proprietary protocols. And usually a lot of data is in the systems, but there is not really a good way to make use of the data from a company-wide perspective. And this is now getting more and more problematic because people have a lot of new use cases they want to build for like predictive maintenance um, and so on. And, and also actually just understanding what is happening in all the, the factories around the, the globe is something uh, that is very important to um, yeah the business owners. And can, we can go to the next slide, please. And what we usually have here is um, what we call a spaghetti architecture. So because people, of course, are trying to break silos for years. And um, but what happens is people go into this kind of spaghetti architecture. A lot of IT folks also know from the large backend systems. And the same is happening on the edge in the factories on the plant floor. Um, yeah, because what's happening is what we see in the next slide. Um, we have a lot of siloed IT systems with no interoperability at all. So what we have here and uh, how you can, can um, to work with the pictures the following. On the left side, you have the 
OT systems. We have here PLCs like from Siemens, Opto22 and, and other vendors. Um, you have devices, which are usually machines. You have gateways, uh, which connect um, things to the uh, other systems like um, like um, analog input output or or other kind of input and output. Um, you see um, OPC UA a lot. You see Modbus a lot. Devices sensors who are directly connected to gateways. But the thing is, you need to connect that to a lot of other systems like SCADA systems, to manufacturing execution systems, to historians, to analytic systems, to applications, and so on. And it's a huge mess to connect existing data to new systems. Because if you're interested in a new application, what you do is you go to the machine, you make sure that you connect all of them, and then you get this huge spaghetti mess you see in the middle here. And this is unmaintainable, and this is problematic. And the goal is really to get much more efficient, and uh, you really don't want to get like exponential um, increase of effort with the amounts of devices you connect. And the operational burden is really high, what we see nowadays. So if you can go to the next slide. So there are a lot of challenges which people face today um, here, as we've seen. It's very difficult to change workflows and processes. It's also extremely difficult to set up new fac uh, facilities and systems or introducing changes. And it's very difficult to analyze data across the entire system because you really do not get um, yeah, a, a very good good view of what's, what's happening. Um, and you really, as we've seen in, in the spaghetti diagram, it's really hard to bring all data together. If you want to have, let's say, all data, you need to connect to all systems. And if you're an IT person, chances are that there are people on the OT side of things who um, will find it very problematic if you introduce a new application uh, to production systems. So what people really want is what we see in the next slide. So what people really want is this kind of decoupled architecture where you have on the OT, on the OT side, you still have your gateways, you have your PLCs, your devices, your OPC UA systems, your Modbus systems, and a lot of this legacy infrastructure you have, and you just cannot change that. And nobody will change that because there's a huge investment that already happened. Um, mm -hmm. And, and you, nobody just changes things because it's, it's um, yeah, new or a new good way to do things. Mm. So, but also on the other side, people want to have the flexibility of the IT, uh, on the IT side. So you still have your MES systems, your historians, your analytics, your applications. And a lot of companies want to introduce new applications on the edge and in the cloud, but they need to connect things. And what people really want is a central hub for, for uh, basically moving data around from gateways to MES systems to historian and so on. And so you can decouple everything. So you get rid of the spaghetti mess we've seen and make sure you have this nice decoupled system where all participants don't care about each other, but just have a central data communication hub that move data around. And what we see in the next slide is that MQTT uh, is the default protocol people use now to yeah move things around. And this is a protocol built for the IoT, for the Internet of Things, and um, it decouples clients and a broker. It's, it uses the publish subscribe protocol, we will see in a minute. It's extensible and reliable. So chances are, if you're doing anything with IoT related, you will use MQTT for industrial IoT as well as for all other IoT, IoT systems, or, so Internet of Things systems. So in the next slide, we will see the publish subscribe pattern where um, things are are decoupled completely. You have a broker in the middle, which is in our case, HiveNQ, but there are also, um, of course, other vendors on the market. HiveNQ is open source, but also we have a commercial um, offering here. Uh, but you could use any MQT broker for that, actually. Um, so you have publishers who send data and you have subscribers who subscribe to data. And you can have as many subscribers as you want for specific data. So if you want to introduce a new application, you just add a new subscriber to data and then the new application will get the data without interrupting anything. And this is bi-directional. So you can consume and publish data 
at the same time over the same channel. But we will see some other issues on the next slide um, that happen. Because if you want to introduce MQTT to an industrial IoT settings, there are still issues. Because devices and endpoints, they have different topics, payloads, and data structures. So you want to make sure that, let's say, the Siemens PLC can talk to, to your machine here. Then you have stuff from Rockwell. Then you have an Opto 22 device. And you have a lot of devices. And you really want to make sure that everything speaks the same language. So it's not only about the same communication channel, which is MQTT to move data around, but also that people understand what kind of data is actually happening here. And this is especially important if you go, at, if you also want to use the data to publish it to other applications like InfluxDB, because in the end, we need to make sure that the data is understood. And uh, yeah, and this is something MQTT doesn't offer out of the box because it's data agnostic and can send anything over MQTT. And um, and the data agnosticity is awesome, but for MQT, but for industrial IoT, you really want to have context because the payload must be interpreted um, by the application consuming data. So if we go one step further, this is where Sparkplug was invented for, and um, and this is what I want to introduce right now. Uh, Sparkplug is a protocol on top of MQDT, which is the default protocol for IIoT and is used to bridge the gap between OT and IT systems. Um, so it defines a topic namespace, a data model structure, and it makes sure that all systems over MQDT speak the same language. And on the next slide, we will see the key concepts, which is... Um, it's basically continuous session awareness, report by exception, interoperability, and auto discovery. So what this happens is you have a plug and play interoperability with Sparkplug. You just bring in your new systems. And if a new system like a device or an application understands Sparkplug, you immediately can get all data out of the systems and into a system. And if you go to the next slide, this is exactly what people want, what we've seen before. To remove the, the burden or the spaghetti architecture, you want to have an MQTT infrastructure using Sparkplug, where you have applications, where you have what we call here edge of network nodes, EON nodes, and your devices. And the Sparkplug edge of network nodes bridge the OT IT gap with MQTT with the, and the MQTT application nodes. So this is a central communication hub with MQTT. You get between your OT systems and your IT systems. And the awesome thing is you don't need to change anything uh, because of your existing infrastructure, you can just add this. So, but how does Influx to be playing to that? And we will see then a demo very quickly. Um, next slide, please. So InfluxDB is awesome uh, as a time series database, as you, as you know, it's ideal for real-time data and it has monitoring dashboards and it can actually replace the old stack in the factory. And this is what we see in the next slide. What, because what you can actually do is, um, InfluxDB is the perfect, let's say, replacement for um, existing analytic systems. Um, and the also awesome thing, you can run it on the edge, but also on the cloud. Because we haven't talked about this yet, but the MQT broker you see here can also be in the cloud. And this is when we will see, Anne will show a, a demo very, very soon. Where you can see um, that the Sparkplug and InfluxDB work beautifully together with cloud offerings as well as on the edge. Hive has a cloud offering, so people can just basically, without, you don't even need to install a broker on your factory edge. You can just go to hivenq.com slash cloud and you get a free broker you can use for connecting all your systems and also connect to InfluxDB. And if you go to the next slide, I will take over uh, to Anya. So she can then, um, yeah, show us a demo. Yeah, thanks from Dominic. Yeah, uh, let me shortly explain <clears throat> what we will demo. We have uh, a couple of MQTT clients that are simulating a Sparkplug scenario with devices, gateways, and a SCADA host. And we have our hyphen queue broker um, that is extended by the Sparkplug extension. And with this extension, we, uh, this can be used to gather MQT Sparkplug metrics from HyphenQ and persist them into InfluxDB. And we configured also HyphenQ bucket on the InfluxDB and uh, additional to 
dashboards are one for spark plug metric visualization and one for hyphen q metrics so now um, we are started our hyphen q and let's have a look if it's running um, so on the terminal you see hyphen q is running and we um, also the influx db cloud sender is created and the hyphen q spark plug extension is uh, is loaded so um, that we can now start our simulation. In our simulation, we have um, simulated a couple of devices, two gateways and one SCADA host. And at first, the SCADA host and the gateways will connect and subscribe to the topic structure that they need. And we have some um, registrations for spark plug metrics. And on our dashboard from the hyphen queue, so the control center, we see the publishes that are started and we see some uh, retained messages. The retained message is something that uh, the SCADA host needs to show their offline uh, or online status. So in this case, it's online. We can also take a look on the client's um, overview and on the client's detail page to see uh, the gateway here in that case and the subscriptions that, um, that were made. And we can now look into our hyphen Q dashboard. This is a very basic dashboard. We have hundreds of um, metrics available, but this dashboard is directly on top of the hyphen Q bucket on our influx um, database. So it's um, there is no layer in between. That's easy to, to set up. And uh, this hyphen Q bucket will be used for the hyphen Q dashboard as well as for the Spark plug dashboard. And in our Spark plug dashboard, we see, um, so beside the number of the gateways and the, and the devices, we see also from the payload our metrics. So in this case, we have um, Spark plug payload with power, level, and temperature met uh, um, metrics. And when we look into the configuration, then we, we can see that we can simply uh, build a query up from our bucket and uh, using um, a pattern that collects all the level metrics in our <clears throat> metric dashboard. And in this case, we have three devices that are sending uh, level metrics. Here on the temperature side, we have um, it's set up in the same manner. So with the temperature pattern, and uh, as you can see, we have five um, metrics available for for this uh, first gateway. Yeah, and uh, there's also, so he can see the, the status, the online status of the devices that belongs to the gateways. And um, you, we have also used uh, a nice um, graphical um, yeah, widget from the Influx um, dashboard here, these, uh, these for the power visualization. And I think now our test um, is finished. And yeah, we see, yeah, it's finished. And we see that our devices are, go are going now offline. And one edge node is, uh, so now all the devices are offline. So this is, yeah, the end of the demo. And maybe it was a little bit fast, uh, but uh, I would like to explain a little bit how we, how we did this here. So we, um, yeah, we set up um, hyphen Q Swarm. This is our open source uh, load test tool to simulate gateways, devices, and the scalar host. And uh, also, um, we can publish Spark plug protobuf payload with hyphen Q Swarm by um, by extending this. And we are publishing these top uh, these to the topics that are defined in the in the Spark plug specification. And we are using our hyphen key broker, so we can use the community edition uh, because um, that's um, enough for setting up this scenario. And uh, we have used our Spark plug extension that is also open source. And the extension, um, as I explained, uh, is um, yeah, we used to create at first uh, an InfluxDB sender um, that is configurable, and then we create in a generic way um, Spark plug metrics from the device metrics itself. And um, yeah, and with uh, with this extension, uh, we currently we support the Spark plug B that is um, 
proto, uh, uh, proto buff and all data will be persisted in an InfluxDB bucket and um, the data can be visualized with InfluxDB dashboards that work directly on top of the buckets. So next slide, please. Yeah, um, so this is uh, on this slide, I would like to explain a little bit what we did in our uh, setup. So we, um, at first we connected the, the gateways uh, and the SCADA host and subscribed to the specific uh, topics that are specified in the Sparkplex spe specification. And then we started uh, publishing um, the status from the from the um, SCADA host so that uh, all participants know um, that the SCADA host is online. And uh, we started uh, after this to publish, um, so not after each other, so in parallel, we start to publishing the birth certificates. This is a type of message uh, defined in the Sparkplug uh, specification to to signal that this gateway and also the devices are online and alive. And after this, um, the data, um, the, so the real data are published uh, periodically from the, uh, from the gateways and, um, and the gateways that, that are responsible for the devices, they forward then the information from the devices. And uh, on the other side, the SCADA host is uh, able to publish some command data uh, as you can see on the on the published topics that are described here, um, so that uh, command data can be so, um, uh, consumed from the from the gateways and um, the data uh, published from the devices and from the gateways can be consumed from the from the SCADA host and all other participants in this scenario. So next slide, please. <coughs> If you like to set up this by your own, because it's really um, easy, um, so we can uh, support you by um, yeah by the things that you can use. So you have you have only to use um, hyphen Q uh, in the community edition. So as Dominic uh, said, you can also use the hyphen Q cloud um, version. That that's also possible. And uh, we provided, um, as I showed in the demo, the Sparkplug InfluxDB extension for HyphenQ that is also uh, open source. And um, uh, yeah, with, with these uh, components and InfluxDB uh, together, it is really easy to set up um, your um, Sparkplug visualization if you have devices or gateways that are able to speak this uh, Sparkplug specification language. So this is um, from my side and we come to the next slides uh, to give you some further informa information. <laughs> next slide, please. Okay, so I will give it back to Dominic that he can give you some more introductions. Thank you, Anna. So, so what you've seen here and um, so, this was like a lot of things happening because what you see in, so now in a very quick way is what companies are looking for doing with like month long POCs. And um, what Anna showed with a, a simulation tool that simulates like actual devices as well as uh, having an open source broker like HyphenQ with an open source Sparkplug extension that also writes to an open source InfluxDB is just awesome because you can just get started like in literally an afternoon and, and and basically start your digitization and modernization project in a factory like without touching anything physical so and this is a complete game changer so Sparkplug is taking over the industrial industrial iot uh, completely um so influx cb is the perfect time series database in order to use that and um yes so if this sounds interesting to you we have a lot of uh, further information. Um, we have um, white papers. We have, uh, if you're a new to MQDT, we recommend the MQDT Essentials. Uh, just use the link here or Google it. There is also a video series available. This is where you can learn about MQDT. There's also Sparkplug Essentials that will give developers and architects the chance to learn about it. Um, and yeah, also check out our GitHub. And so 
also reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, Sparkplug is something if you're doing industrial IT, you need to learn about Sparkplug and also Influx is one of the most powerful tools out on the market. Use that. Also, Influx Cloud is a perfect companion to that, what we just saw for production use case, as well as Hive Vigue Cloud if you don't run, want to run an infrastructure you own. So, um, but without further ado, I think we can also have time for some uh, questions um, so we can dive into what people think. Okay. So, oh, there are good, good, good questions here already. Go for it. Dumb. Okay. You can read the questions out loud. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Perfect. So, can I recommend a good Sparkplug enabled SCADA system? Oh, is a, oh, good question. Um, there are a lot of vendors out there. So, um, so yes. So there is like the. Let's say most most prominent uh, ones. So there are things like inductive automation, but there are also things like like uh, TedSoft um, and and a lot of other vendors. So what we what we did is we created um, a, what we call um, a Sparkplug landscape a diagram, which is uh, av available on HiveView.com uh, on Sparkplug. So because what we have collected a lot of vendors here for anything here. So for example, for SCADA vendors, there's inductive automations, Aviva, Tedsoft, Reonix, Redix, Reliance, and a lot of others. But you can find all of that on our Sparkplug landscape diagram. We, we update regularly where we see um, a lot of vendors who support Sparkplug and MQD out of the box. Okay, there's a second question. Um, how is failover handled within Edge of network nodes and gateways. Oh, it's a good question. So failover is one of the key things. Uh, usually, so Sparkplug has a whole section in specification about redundancy. Um, like to make it like for starters, usually you, you so also in the OT world, you usually have redundancy. So because um, you don't have this fancy cloud native ways of doing failovers usually. So people really rely on redundancy. So what you have, because our edge of network node very often is also a piece of hardware. So for example, if you're using um, I think something from Opto22, uh, which is also a vendor, which we, which um, yeah, we also know pretty well and they have good Sparkplug support. Um, you usually have two of them and and then the scale system also makes sure that you have the two of them and then you do the failover. So because you also want to make sure that you, if your hardware device fails, a second one can take over. So, but, but this, I, I think it really depends a bit on the, uh, on the use case and what you want to do. If you have like a very concrete thing you want to talk about, also please reach out to us so we can give you on the concrete architecture looking at how you would do failover. But usually you do redundancy. Cool. You know, Dominic and Anya, you in your slides, you make everything look super simple. Um, but you know, the reality is that a lot of your customers, their environment's not that simple. And um, yeah. you know, it's it's a little overwhelming for them, right, to even consider the possibility of using any of these more modern tools. Um, but you know, I think if we don't, if we can just for a minute, just touch upon a little bit, you know, what are some of the things that these modern tools can can bring to those customers that are just not they're not available to them with the uh with the legacy tools that they have oh yeah this is a very good question um so so one thing a lot of customers are looking forward to is uh, in the end they want to increase the overall equipment efficiency this is what what it's about and they want to do this by um by having better insights into what the business is actually doing uh, and then improve it. So, so also the agility people know from the IT side is something OT folks really want to have. And um, a lot of the tools like we have with InfluxDB with a time series database is super flexible. Also with an MQT Sparkplug based architecture, you get that flexibility because you, you've gone away from this, okay, I wire everything together and then I have something I need to support for 40 years because you have the flexibility here and this gives you agility and this allows you to iterate and, and get better. Um, and uh, so it's about saving costs in the end. And I mean, we talk about a lot. I haven't talked about the bandwidth consumption, uh, which is like a factor 100 or so less with Sparkplug than with OPC UA, for example, um, which also comes all with the cost saving. Um, 
But yeah, in the end, it's not simple. But what people do is they have the legacy infrastructure and you can add spark plug as a side channel without modifying anything what you have. So there is really no risk in trying, trying that and improving that. And this is the route many customers are going. So a POC is important, but the POC usually takes now like weeks and not months or years as people are used to in the OT side. And this blows people's mind completely. This is why Sparkplug is such a hot topic right now. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of bandwidth, I mean, sometimes your customers are in, in situations where, yeah, there isn't a lot of bandwidth. It could be, you know, maybe yeah. they're deep under the earth, right? They could be underground mining. It could be a hydroelectric dam. Yeah. It could be places where there is just zero connectivity. And so they're definitely yeah. using, you know, LoRa or, you know, whatever minimized uh, bandwidth that they can. Um, yeah, yeah. And then I no. think the other the other thing that um, I thought I'd share is that um, from an influx perspective, MQTT currently is probably the most um, searched uh, telegraph plugin. Uh, so, you know, there's definitely, I think, a lot of interest. And I think, you know, the, the two projects uh, make a lot of sense together. Um, but I think, what are some other things? I, I think just listening to some of your, to, to some customers in the industrial context, you know, things like ML is not even a possibility with some of these traditional um, systems because they can't collect yeah. enough data. Any right, comments right. about that? And, uh, yes, yes. And there are two, two things. On the one side, you need to collect the data and sometimes there is not a possibility, but in order to make something useful of it, you need to collect a lot of data. So, so uh, you just cannot use your, let's say, um, old uh, relational database and just pump in some time series data and just hope that this won't blow up. Because like people are collecting so much data, need to collect so much data uh, for the ML use cases that you need to uh, have a proper database to, to store that. And um, this is something like a time series service like Influx provides. So this is like the because these are time series data. I, I, IoT data is time series data. So you really want to have this something like an influx um, database so you can then work with the data and do something meaningful with that. And there's so much data that is produced and needs to be produced. And the ones that you need a broker that can handle all the traffic. And then also you need the integration, which we showed today, where the broker itself can natively pump data into InfluxDB with the native protocols and APIs InfluxDB provide. So you can literally pump in tens of thousands or almost hundreds of thousands of data points per second into Influx and then do something meaningful with the data. And this just wasn't possible before because the technology was just not built for these use cases. And this is why we need a new stack um, with MQTT, Sparkplug uh, and InfluxDB. So this is why it's so important. Yeah, and also um, for everybody there, um, there's also been some uh, community members that have also contributed some flux queries so that you can get that OEE, that, um, you know, get those, your devices in your factory floor to be a lot more efficient. And I suspect that there's going to be even more contributions uh, on that side as well. Um, like I said, uh, it's, t it's worth taking a look at what these guys have built. It's, um, they make it look really easy. It's actually a very complicated situation for a lot of their com com customers underneath. Um, but, um, and it's also, I think, challenging for their customers to try to squeeze out that extra bit of revenue. Um, we take these things kind of for granted in the IT space, but in the uh, industrial space, it is tricky to try to get any kind of savings. Um, and I think the only way that they're able to do that is to collect more data, to try to understand what, where the inefficiencies are, whether it's equipment or whether it's materials or, or humans, et cetera. So great job, Dominic and Anya. Any last thoughts before we um, switch to the community talk? Any closing comments? No, I, I think we're good. So, so really, if you're into IIoT, um, you really want to, as, as I think we emphasized here, you really want to check out um, how time series database like Influx to be will help you and also make sure the data movement is something you really take care of because in order to make value out of data, you need to have the data where it's supposed to be. So uh, store it where it should be, it's supposed to be and also move the data where it's supposed to be. And uh, yeah, I, I think this is really just a be just a beginning. So this will be a mainstream topic very soon. Cool. And I'm actually going to check out the Hive MQ Swarm. I, I didn't even realize that was there, so I can actually play around with that. 
Well, thank you so much, yes. Anya and Dominic, and um, we'll see you guys um, again soon.